Hi everyone, uh, welcome back to Information Economics. Today we're going to introduce again a screening model, but now we're going to change the technical assumption. We're going to introduce the continuous type screening model. So in this video, I'm going to give you an introduction and overview of our, our plan. And then we're going to first introduce some mathematical preliminaries that you need to have for you to characterize the optimal contract. We then use those tools to really derive the optimal contracts to you. And finally, give you some implications of that. Okay, so recall that we used, we introduced the monopoly pricing screening problem to you with two kinds of consumers. Okay, we assumed that consumers have a private, private type theta, which may be theta low or theta high. And the theta low means the consumer is not so willing to pay for this product. The seller believes that there is a distribution for theta. From the seller's perspective, theta is random, which may be theta L with some probability and theta H with some other probabilities. Once obtaining Q units by paying T, a type theta consumer's utility is denoted in this way, okay? Theta times V of Q minus T, where V of Q is a strictly increasing and strictly concave function. And if the consumer does not eat anything, the consumer gets nothing, okay? So that's the standard setting we introduced with our two-type model. There are some other things. The unit production cost is C, which is less than theta L. By selling Q units and receiving T, the seller would earn T minus CQ. So this is the seller's profit function or utility function. The question is how to price the products so that we may maximize the expected profit. Okay, So that's the seller's contract design problem about choosing uh, the prices for the products with different quantities. Because we assume that there are two kinds of consumers, so we say this is a two-type screening model. Okay, so very quickly let's review what's that. The two-type screening model can be formulated in this way. We're going to have two contracts, a menu of two contracts to be designed because there are two types Okay, two types, so we design two contracts, one for the high type, one for the low type. We know this is optimal, this can be optimal because we have a revelation principle. Okay, given that the high type and the low type will choose the contract THQH and TALQL, we know that this is our expected profit. The first two constraints are incentive compatible or truth telling constraints. That means if you are a high type consumer, you prefer the high contract than the to the low contract. Or if you are a low type consumer, you prefer the low contract. The last two constraints are the individual rationality or participation constraints. Okay? By choosing the high contract or the low contract, the high type consumer and the low type consumer they can earn a positive utility non-negative utility. We can use some ways to solve this problem, okay? Under a certain condition, the optimal menu, oh sorry, this should be small t, okay, small t, your optimal menu would be satisfying this and that, okay? And we mentioned to you that this tells you that we have efficiency at top. Okay, for the high type, the quantity is efficient. Here we have downward distortion. For the low type, the quantity is distorted downwards. Okay, we also have uh, monotonicity. We also have um, no rent at the bottom. If you have forgotten what are them, uh, you probably need to do some brief reviews. Now we ask one question. May we generalize this problem to n types? Okay. Because no one says consumers would only be of two kinds. There may be more than two kinds. So let's see whether we can do it or not. Okay, so in a general setting, 
set up may be of types theta one, theta two, up to theta n, and the theta one is the smallest, theta n is the largest. Now we say okay for probability of theta to be theta i, let's say it is beta i. Okay, so beta i is the probability. And then the n type screening problem is formulated in this way. Again, this is the expected profit given that all types of consumers will choose the contract intended for them. And then this is IC, this is IR. For a type I, for a consumer whose true type is type I, okay, he would prefer choosing contract I to choosing some other contract J. So we need to, that to have for OI, for OJ, that's IC constraint. Also, we have IR constraint to make sure that all types of consumers are willing to participate. Okay, so we can formulate this. May we find the optimal menu? The answer is yes. We can do some um, derivations and show that the problem can be reduced to this. The objective function is the same, but for the constraints, first, only those local downward IC constraints are necessary. Okay, so it's here. We only need to make sure that type 2 does not want to pretend to be type 1. Type 3 does not want to pretend to be type 2, and so on and so on. So you don't need to worry about whether type 1 wants to pretend to be type 5, whether type 7 wants to pretend to be type 2. Well, you don't need to worry about that because they are all redundant. You have the intuition for that, you have the derivation for that, there is no problem for that. Also, only one IR constraint would be necessary, which is the lowest one. Okay, which is the lowest one. The one for the type theta one. So here we actually have some intuition about that. If you like the product, you're going to pretend that you don't like the product. That's why you only need downward IC to prevent that to happen. You also only need local IC because if you can prevent 3 from pretending to be 2, two uh, prevent 2 from um, pretending to be 1, then with some very naive derivations, you can show that 3 would also have no incentive to pretend to be 1. For IR, it's the same thing. If you have a chance to lie, you have the threat to lie, then you receive some information rent. That happens as long as you are not of the lowest type, okay? So only the lowest type would be bounded below by an IR constraint, and eventually he's going to receive no rent. So we still have no rent at bottom, we still have efficiency at top that can be shown, and we also have monopolicity. Eventually Q1 would be less than Q2, less than Q3, and so on and so on. So this is fine. So we can still proceed to solve all those pro all this uh, all this problem and uh, find the optimal contracts to you but let's do one more step may we generalize this problem again to infinitely many types on a continuum no, within an interval so what does that mean let's see the formulation suppose theta now may be anything any value within an interval theta 0 and theta 1. Okay? Theta 0 is a value that is less than theta 1. And now we have an interval. Theta may be anything on it. So now, from the seller's perspective, theta is random. And now you cannot assign probabilities to possible values of theta. Because now you have infinitely many possible values of theta. So you are going to have a continuous random variable. That's why you need F and capital F to be the PDF and the CDF for your random variable theta. Okay? I don't know what's theta because theta is random, but I know it's PDF and CDF. And that's my belief on the random type or the private type. Then our continuous type screening problem can be formulated in this way. First is the objective function. Well, even though now you are looking at an integral with some PDF here, you know this is trying to calculate the expected profit of the seller. 
okay? Because you have so many different types of consumers. Each type is going to be induced to select the contract that is intended for him. Okay? So he is going to pay T of theta amount of money and obtain Q theta, Q of theta units of product. So for type theta, you're going to earn this and you have all these types. So you find the weighted average of the earning in that case with that likelihood. So this is your expected profit for the continuous type model. And then for all the types of consumers, they have the choice to misreport their type, to lie about their type. So here, they should choose Q theta, T theta. But they have the chance to choose Q theta hat, T theta hat. We need to make sure that choosing the right contract is the best for them. And finally, we need to make sure that choosing the good, uh, choosing the right contract, can earn a plus negative, non-negative utility. Okay, so this is exactly a generalization from the two type or the n type model. Then now, um, um, remind, let me remind you one thing. You have so many variables, right? Or you have infinitely many Q, infinitely many T. For each type, you are going to assign two values, Q and T, to him. And he is going to select that contract. So you are going to offer really an infinitely many, infinitely many contracts in your menu. So you are going to optimize this problem where your decision variables are actually functions okay functions you want to find two functions to maximize your expected profit that's the problem okay today we're going to tell you how to solve this problem and find the optimal menu and show you that all the original implications you had will still be true and we can extend them to some, some other things that you cannot do without a continuous type model. Okay, so that's the plan for today. Thank you. Okay, let's continue. So now let's give you some introduction to some mathematical tools you need. So we're going to introduce three things. Um, the concept of hazard or failure rates, integration by parts, and envelope theorem. Okay, the last thing may be new to most of you, so please pay attention to that. Okay, so uh, let's introduce failure or hazard rates first. So consider a Bob uh, whose life is uh, denoted as a random variable, capital X. So this capital S means once you uh, light up the Bob, uh, when it will fail. Okay, so you can treat that to be any machine, any computer, whatever. So there is a life, there is an amount of time that it can be used. That's a capital X, and of course it's non-negative. So you don't know what would be the value of X, X is random. So you use small f and capital F to be the um, CDF, a PDF and a CDF. So capital F of T is the probability for the bob to fail by time t, okay? So that's the probability for the lifetime to be not so long, not longer than t. And then if you ask what's the probability for the bob to fall or to fail within a certain interval, then you have capital F uh, and t plus uh, epsilon minus capital F of t. Okay, that's the probability to fail in this particular time interval. So we know that small f of t basically means the pro that particular probability when epsilon goes to zero. Okay, it's the limiting probability. Or you can also say that okay, it's just the derivative. Okay, but as you know, we don't say it is a probability. We say it is a density, okay? Probability density for the bob to fail at exactly at time t, okay? Given that capital X is continuous, this probability 
would be zero. Well, what you can say is is density. Okay, is is density. Anyway, <coughs> the failure rate of the bulb, uh, which is defined as h of t, is the likelihood for the bulb to fail exactly at time t, given that the bulb has not failed by time t. Okay. So basically, at each time moment, at each time moment, I ask, what's the failure rate? What's the rate for the product for the bulb to fail exactly at this moment? Okay, I want to know that, but I don't want to just use f of t because I know the bulb uh, is is there. Is the bulb is good for this particular amount of time? Okay. When I am at time t, I know this bulb has been good from zero to t. So given this condition, given my information about that, I want to ask what's the probability for x for to be within t plus t epsilon and t plus epsilon. Okay, I want to ask what's that failure rate. And then、uh, through some very basic derivation, you know this is a conditional probability. So the conditional probability requires you to put this probability for x to be greater than t in the denominator, and the numerator is the joint probability. When you look at that, the second condition is useless, right? Because you are talking about x within t and t plus epsilon. So You're going to get this, and when you take the limit, it's going to be this one. So eventually, we can say, okay, the failure rate can be calculated as the ratio between small f of t, oh sorry, t, over one minus capital F of t. Okay, so the numerator is the likelihood to be failed. To be、uh, the likelihood to fail at time t, and the denominator is the case that you 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 condition this failure according to the fact that x has been larger than small t. Okay, so it's the concept of conditional probability. So very quickly, let's talk about some examples. If your capital X is uniform between zero and one, then your PDF is one. And your CDF is x, and then your h of x, which is your failure rate, is defined to be one over one minus x. Okay, when x is zero, this is one. When x approaches one, this goes to infinity. You can see that your hazard rate would increase. Also, basically, that's saying that、uh, when when this product, when this machine goes on, goes on, goes on. You expect a higher rate for it to fail when time goes by. Okay, reasonable. A very special case is for your x to be exponentially distributed with parameter lambda. In that case, your PDF is like this, and your CDF is like this. Now, they are just、uh, some standard result that you may、uh, look it up on Wikipedia or any particular textbook. And then, if you plug in small f and capital F into the formula for hazard rate, we're going to see that the hazard rate would just be lambda, would just be lambda, and that means if the probability distribution is exponential, then at any moment your failure rate is the same. Okay,、uh, if you're talking about、um, some probability、uh, random events with this. Particular property, we typically say that your distribution is memoryless. Okay, memoryless. Anyway, yeah, some something about probability. So, in general, for any random variable with PDF small f and capital F as the CDF, we define its failure rate as small h, which is f over one minus capital F. Uh, you don't really need to talk about bulb or computer or machine or whatever. For any random variable, you can do this definition. Okay, so yeah, it's just definition. For our private type theta, okay, it's also a random variable with f and f. So 
we're going to impose the following assumption, which is called the increasing failure rate or IFR function uh, uh, assumption. It's saying that I want the failure rate of my theta to be increasing, or say it in another way. I, if I define capital H of theta to be the ratio of 1 minus f of theta over small f of theta, then I can see this is the reciprocal of the failure rate, right? And then I need my capital H of theta to be weakly decreasing in theta, okay? So I want my failure rate to increase, or I want my reciprocal of failure rate to decrease. So we, we are not going to show that to you, but this is true for most of the well-known distributions like uniform. Okay, You see uniform satisfies this. Exponential also satisfies this because all you need is weakly increasing or weakly decreasing. We can show that normal is this, is also following this assumption, gamma, beta, Weibo, whatever. Most of the well-known distributions satisfies this assumption. So it, it does not really hurt to make this assumption. So in later um, derivations, we're going to assume that for your private random theta, the failure rate would be increasing. Okay? Okay. The second thing to help you uh, to review or to learn is integration by parts. It's a specific technique to do uh, integration. So suppose u and v are two functions of x defined over an interval a and b. We're going to have the, 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 the product rule for differentiation, right? The derivative of u and v, the product of u and v, can be found as u v prime plus v u prime, where prime means derivative, okay, first order derivative. So if you have this, if you have this, then you now can do integration at both sides with respect to x. So this part goes to here, okay? be put as the uh, integrand and here you also have this part this also goes to the integrand and then we can do something we can do something first is here you can see that uh, when we do this integration you can apply uh, the, the, the theory of calculus or the Leibniz rule because it's something being differentiated and then taking the integral so it goes back to itself and all we need to do is to plug in a and b okay nothing special and then uh, this is the term that we are really interested in we put it still at the, 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 the one side of the equation and then finally we put the last term to the left hand side Okay, so that's why its sign would be changed. So this particular formula is what we are going to use as the integration by part formula. When you have one integral to, uh, to do, then you separate it into two parts, okay, into two parts, and then following this formula to uh, carry it over, okay? Uh, for most of the time, we would like to use some abbreviated formula to help us memorize it, okay? And the way we say it is that u dv equals uv minus v du, okay? u dv equals uv minus v du. So let's see some examples. Suppose I want to calculate this. I want to calculate the integral of x e to the power of x from 0 to 1. So I don't have any way to do it directly, but I can separate this thing into two parts. I can say u is x and dv is e x dx. If you and once we do that, then according to our formula, oh, let me write down it again, u dv equals uv minus v du. 
then we can know here we should have UV and then we're going to plug in the upper bound and lower, lower bound to it and then we also have minus V du so here uh, of course u is x so u is x so nothing difficult and if u is x then when you take a first order derivative of that that's going to be just 1 okay so you're going to have du equals dx also if your dv is this guy then you need to be able to find v okay and you know v would be e of x e to the power of x because the derivative of e to the power of x would just be e to the power of x okay that's how you find v according to dv so once you do that then the first part can be calculated you plug in 0 you get 0 you plug in 1 you get e and the second part can also be done because you know how to do this integration this integration simply gives you e to the power of x from 0 to 1 so you again plug in and you get e minus 1 eventually you get 1 as the outcome let's use another example to do a further illustration uh, here we are actually talking about 0 and 1 sorry so when I want to do this I don't know how to do it but I can use integration by parts again so I let u to be x squared dv to be e to the power of x dx and then I have this this is uv okay uv the same thing and here I have v du here du would be 2x times dx instead of just dx because x squared if you differentiate it you get 2x so now again here I can get e nothing special and here this is something that I need to do integration by part again if I take 2 outside then I get something like this okay not easy but I know how to do it because this is exactly what I did just a few minutes ago so I can carry on and eventually find this as my final outcome okay so that's integration by parts um, both of the things will be used later when we do the uh, solution we will try to find the solution of our optimal contract design problem so you're going to see them later thank you okay the last uh, mathematical tool that we need to tell you is about how a parameter may affect the objective value so consider a function small f which is affected by x and theta and the optimization problem of trying to maximize small f with respect to x you may interpret x as your decision variable and the theta something you cannot control as your parameter okay so here z star of theta means that uh, given some parameter theta you try your best to find an optimal x and then according to your optimal decision how much you are going to earn so this is your optimized objective value or the maximum attainable objective value given theta okay so it's a function of theta if we say that x star of theta is the maximum or the maximizer of small f okay then we can further express z star of theta as this it's just that we plug in the optimal solution of x into our objective function then we're going to get z star of course okay here uh, make sure that you know we are using the notation in instead of equal because you can have multiple optimal solutions now what we are interested in is this quantity okay suppose this can be differentiated then we want to ask what's the derivative of z star of theta how does theta affect the objective value okay one particular application of that quantity is that we want to know how an outside how an exogenous parameter may affect the equilibrium utility of a specific person okay 
we typically say, okay, there's a supply chain, there are manufacturers, retailers, and blah, blah, blah. And eventually we ask, what would happen if the unit production cost goes up, for example? The exogenous parameters change would change also the player's decision, okay? Because players try to try the best to find their optimal solutions. And then, even that, their optimal payoff would also change. So, you're asking uh, how the, the parameter affect their decision and then affect their payoff, okay? I now want to ask directly how does theta, how does the parameter affect its payoff? So as a very quick example, suppose f of x theta is defined in this way, okay, theta minus uh, x minus theta squared. Given that theta is fixed, we have this as our optimal solution, okay? You can very quickly verify that this is concave. So your first order condition gives you an optimal solution. If theta is theta, then your optimal x would also be theta. If you plug in that back to the formula, then you're going to get theta as your z star of theta. Okay? Then obviously, if you take the differentiation, then you're going to get 1. Well, that's um, a very basic example about what we are talking about. This is the, for example, a utility function. This is a parameter. Given that parameter, a decision maker finds the optimal solution. Plugging it, you get the utility as a function of the parameter. And then you do the differentiation. That's your, uh, that's the impact of the parameter on your equilibrium payoff. So to find this particular derivative in general, we follow the three steps. Find the optimal solution according to theta, plugging that into the objective function and then take the derivative, nothing special. Here, we want to ask that may we do this thing uh, in some sense in a more di direct way or may we change the order of doing the three steps. And then with the envelope theorem, we're going to show you that we can. We're going to use a different order. I will still first find an optimal solution, but instead of plugging that solution into the objective function, I'm going to first take the derivative of the objective function. Okay, And as you will see, typically that would be easier. And after I take the derivative, then I plug in the optimal x. I'm going to show you that this and that will give you the same thing. Okay, And then if this is going to be easier, then we're going to prefer using the envelope theorem because in many cases that can greatly reduce the amount of calculation we need to do. So proposition one. Proposition one is that given a function small f, that x star of theta be an optimal solution when theta is given and that z star of theta be the optimized objective value. Then, if you want to find how theta affects z star of theta, what you may do is to first, you take derivative of f with respect to theta by assuming that x is a constant. And after you do that, after you find the derivative, then plug in the optimal solution as a function of theta. So let's see how to use it. Oh, sorry, let's see how to prove it first. So <clears throat> I want to calculate this, right? And z star is just f of x star and then theta. So this is just by definition. And then when I go from the first line to the second line, I use something called the total differential formula. Okay, because f has two components f have two um, parameters or two arguments. So what I should do is to first use um, take a derivative of f with respect to the first argument. And then the first argument itself is a function of theta. So I need to do that again uh, and then multiply them. And then I need to do a second part. f 
has the second argument, so I need to differentiate f according to the second argument. Okay, so this is how I get this particular thing uh, according to our um, the so-called total differential formula. Once I do that, I'm going to plug in the optimal solution into um, those uh, x parts. Uh, and you're going to plug in x to here and here uh, because at this moment you are assuming that x is still a constant. Okay, x is still a constant. And then you plug in after that. So from here to here you are talking about total differential. And then, okay, so now let's do it. Let's plug in x. Let's plug in x. The interesting thing is that when you plug in x into the first term, because the value of your x is an optimal solution. So when you plug in, you're going to get zero directly. Why? Because your x star satisfies the first order condition of small f. So that's why this particular derivative must be zero at any optimal solution. Right? If x is really optimal, then f would be uh, the de derivative of x must be zero at that optimal solution. So that's why we can cancel out the first term and eventually only get the last term. And that's exactly your envelope theorem. f take derivative with respect to theta by assuming that x is a constant. And after that, plug in your optimal solution. So consider the example that we did uh, two slices ago. Now I don't want to plug in x first. I want to first find the derivative. And if I try to do that, now I take derivative with respect to theta by assuming that x is a constant. Okay, so I get 1 plus 2 times x minus theta. Oh, here, I don't treat x as x of theta. I only treat it as a constant. And after that, after I find this, I then plug in x with its optimal value, and then I get 1, exactly. Or, as in another example, I have this, okay, small f as negative 1 over 3 times x to the power of 3 plus theta times x. Now, if I don't have the envelope theorem, what I should do is to first find an optimal solution. Okay, again, you can verify that with first order condition, this is your optimal solution. And then plug in that to get z star of theta as a function of theta. Okay, I can do it. And then lastly, do the differentiation. With the envelope theorem, we can use a different way. First, I have the optimal solution. I'm going to keep it for a while because later I need to use it. And then, without plugging x I take the derivative directly by treating x as a constant. By treating x as a constant. In that case, the first term would just become 0 because there is no theta there. And here, theta would just become 1. So that's why I get x as the outcome. And then all I need to do is to plug in the optimal solution into x. I get square root of theta. Okay, so this and that, they are the same, of course, because envelope theorem allows us to change the order of the calculation. Finally, I hope you can convince yourself that the optimal x indeed satisfies the first order condition. Okay, this is something that you may verify, and once you plug in, it will also be zero. That's going to be always true, because according to our proof in the previous slides, well, it's a curve, it's an optimization problem. And then you claim this is optimal, so it satisfies the first order condition. That's why this derivative becomes zero. Okay, so that's the three tools that you're going to use in later derivations. So yeah, when they happen, uh, I'm going to remind you again, so don't worry. Thank you. Okay, so let's try to solve our contract design problem. The problem that we want to solve is this one. Okay, I want to maximize my, my expected profit 
subject to IC and IR constraints. Here, I need to find two functions, one function as Q, the other function as T, or you can interpret that you need to decide the QT pair for infinitely many types. Okay, so in some sense, even if you have taken courses like OR or basic optimization, this would seem to be very strange because you have infinitely many variables and infinitely many constraints. Okay, so I hope you are feeling excited now because you're going to solve a problem that in some sense is very complicated. Our strategy, uh, however, is actually very similar to our strategy for solving the two-type problem. We're going to first show you monotonicity, which again means a high-type consumer would um, eat more, consume more. Okay, consume more. So we're going to show you that Q theta 1 would be greater than Q theta 2 if theta 1 is greater than theta 2. And then among all the IR constraints, we're going to show you that only the IR constraint for the lowest type is necessary. When you have two types, the IR for the low type is necessary. Now you have an, uh, a lot of types, only the lowest type is necessary. Among all the IC constraints, we're going to show you that only those local IC constraints are necessary. Okay, so you don't need those global IC. All you need to worry about is that your choice is optimal locally. Okay, and then after all those reductions, we can use binding constraints to get an unconstrained problem. And then we will do something called pointwise optimization to deal with that unconstrained problem. So let's do it one by one. So our step one is monotonicity. And the thing that we need to do is exactly the same as in the past. As long as we have two types theta and theta hat, suppose we say theta is greater than theta hat, then we have the two IC constraints between the two types. Okay, Type theta should prefer the contract theta to contract theta head. Type theta head should prefer the contract theta head to the contract theta. If we add the two constraints together, we're going to basically get exactly the same thing as we did for discrete types. Okay? T would cancel each other. And then we put the, the two terms with the same V of Q together. And then theta minus theta head would cancel each other because they are positive, so the sign would still be the same. And finally, because v is, mon v is monotonely increasing, so if v of q is greater than v of q and theta head, then your q of theta would be greater than or equal to your q of theta head. Okay? So as a conclusion, if your type is higher than the quantity assigned offered to you would also be larger, okay? Because this is a continuous type problem, we can also show you that this just means that your Q should have a positive or non-negative derivative, okay? Q must be increasing or weakly increasing. So monotonicity, we have that. And then let's reduce our IR constraints. Suppose I have a type theta, which is not the lowest type. Okay, the lowest type is theta zero. Suppose my type is greater than that, then I have a sequence of derivations. First, I can take the IC constraint for the type theta with respect to the type theta zero. Okay, if I am of type theta, I should prefer contract theta to contract theta zero. Okay, so this part is your IC constraint. And then from here to here, you use the fact that theta is greater than theta zero. And finally here, this is your IR constraint for the lowest type. Okay, so as long as the lowest type satisfies its IR constraint, then 
all the types would satisfy their IR constraints. Okay, this is again exactly the same as what we did for the two type or n type problems. Okay, so we only need the lowest type IR constraint. Now all others can be removed. So now your reduced problem is here. Uh, objective function the same, IC constraint the same, but for IR constraint you only need one. All others are redundant. Now we're going to reduce the set of IC constraints. Or when we say IC constraints, we are actually talking about global IC constraints. Okay, that's too much. That's too many. We don't need all of them. We're going to reduce them to local IC constraints. And our eventual goal would be to show that the set of global IC constraints can be replaced by the set of local IC constraints plus monotonicity. Okay, so let's try to do it. First, well, let me formalize what we mean by global IC constraints. This is our global IC, right? Let's rewrite it in another way. For each type, for each type of agent, I know that guy is trying to select a type theta hat to report. And by selecting theta hat, he is going to select the contract Q theta hat and T theta hat. So that guy is trying to select theta hat to maximize his expected profit, okay, expected utility. And my goal is to make sure that for this opti for the agent's optimization problem, theta is optimal. Okay, theta is optimal. So theta must be greater than all other values in S. All other values in S. If that's the case, then it's globally optimal. Okay? So it should be optimal for a consumer to report his true type. That's global IC constraint. Theta must be better than all other values in S. Okay, we want to show that local IC and the monotonicity can be equivalent to global IC. So <coughs> we need some notations. That W of theta, theta hat, be defined in this way. Okay, theta of uh, theta times V of Q of theta hat minus T of theta hat. This is what? This is the type theta consumer's utility by misreporting his type as theta hat. Okay? So my true type is here. Okay? My true type is here. And I report myself as theta hat by selecting another contract. Okay? He can do that and once he do that he does that. This is the utility. With this notation, global IC would just be that theta should be the best to maximize the utility in that way. If theta is globally optimal, of course it must also be locally optimal. And what does that mean? That means your optimal solution, theta, must satisfy the first order condition. Okay, if it is globally optimal, it must satisfy the first order condition in this sense. So this is the function to maximize. Okay, here theta is actually a constant because my type is theta. I am type theta consumer. I try to optimize my objective value according to theta hat, according to theta hat. So that means theta hat is my variable. Theta is a parameter. Okay? So I want to maximize this function. If some variable, if some value is optimal, that means the first order derivative must be zero when I choose that value as my variable's value. Okay? So that's the first order condition. If theta is optimal, then when I plug in theta to the first order derivative, I need to get zero. So W is like this. Okay? So when you differentiate W with respect to theta hat, 
for the first turn, you need to use the chain rule because this is v of q of theta hat. v is a function of q, q is a function of hat. Uh, q is a function of theta hat. So you first have v prime of something, and then you differentiate q with respect to theta hat. For the second term, it just goes to t prime. And then I plug in theta hat as theta. I should get this. Okay? So this equation would be called our local IC constraints. Local IC constraints. If theta satisfies this equality, it does not guarantee that it is optimal. Okay? It is just locally optimal. Okay? Just like you have something like this. Here you have a point whose first order derivative is zero. And this is necessary, but it does not guarantee that it is optimal. So first order condition is just necessary. Okay, but anyway, that's local IC. And we also have monotonicity. We want to show that this plus this equals the set of global IC constraints. Or in a sense that we want to show you that local IC constraints are the only set that is necessary. Okay, so to show that this and that are the same, we need to show that local IC plus, non -mono, uh, plus monotonicity can imply each constraint in the global IC set. Or the other way, with global IC, we can prove local IC and the monotonicity are true. The first, the first one, on from right to left, is very obvious. So first, uh, by definition, if something is globally optimal, it must be locally optimal, okay? According to our derivation in the previous slide, by definition, this is true. Also, in step 1, we have shown that if you have all those IC constraints, then you can have monotonicity, okay? So, this part is done. Now, let's work on the second part. Suppose that's false. Suppose that's not true. That means I can find a type theta where there is a reason to lie. Okay? So that guy would find reporting theta hat is better than reporting theta. Okay? For some theta hat, I don't know. But anyway, that guy finds this is the benefit of telling the truth. This is the benefit of lying. And I want to show that is pass I want to show that this is impossible. I'll say it again. I assume that I have local IC. I assume that I have monotonicity. But I assume that I do not have, do not have global IC. If I do not have global IC, I should be able to find theta and the theta head for this to be true. So, without loss of generality, that theta head to be greater than theta. If that's not the case, we just need to reverse their uh, notation. So now our uh, theta hat is greater. In that case, we have the following relationships. Okay, This is the quantity that we are interested in, and we claim that it is, not, it is positive. And now, for this one, the second argument is the variable. So we can rewrite the difference into this. Okay? The variable is x. We find its derivative. We find its slope or derivative. And then we do an integration from the lower part to the upper part. If you need some kind of um, um, reference, then this may help. Okay? Recall yourself that if you want to calculate fa minus fb, then how can, what can you do? You can do an integral from um, for f of prime of x from a to b. Okay? And this is exactly the um, theory of calculus. You have f, you differentiate it, and then integrate it. You are going to get itself, and then plug in the upper bound and the lower bound. And this is exactly the same thing here. And then when we have this, this can be done, right? In the previous page, we have shown this to you. This is what you get if you differentiate w with respect to x. And for here, 
for here. Now I replace theta by x. Okay, x is some value within theta and the theta hat. If theta hat is greater than theta, then x is also greater than theta. And I know the whole term here would going to become larger when theta becomes x. Why is that? Because this and this, they are all non-negative. V prime is the slope of V. V is your utility, uh, the part of your concave utility function. So V prime is positive. Okay? And the Q prime is non-negative. Why do you know that? Because you know, you assume that you have monotonicity. So that's why this is fine. And that's why this is fine. You have monotonicity so that you have this inequality. Lastly, I now claim that this is just zero. Why is that? Because this part is just your local IC. And for any x, this is zero. So the integral would also be zero. Okay? So with monotonicity, you have this inequality. And with local IC, you establish that this is zero. And then, that's a, that's a contradiction. You claim that this is positive, but actually, this must be non-positive. So that's a contradiction. You cannot find this. And local IC and the monotonicity is enough to imply global IC. Okay? Okay, so that's step three. Now let's continue in the next video. <coughs> okay, so after step one, two, three, now we actually can reduce our problem to this. The objective function is still the same, but first, you only have one IR constraint. And also, you now do not need that huge set of global IC constraints. All you need is local IC, Okay, local IC, which is the first order condition for global IC, and monotonicity. Our step four would be to ignore the non uh, sorry to ignore the monotonicity constraints for a while. So we're going to remove this for a while, and focus on the other two sets of constraints. We will find the optimal solution of the relaxed program. Okay, and then we will go back to verify that our optimal solution of the relaxed program really satisfies the non -mono the monotonicity constraints. Okay, if that's the case, then we're done. So now in our reduced program, we only have two sets of constraints, one IR and a few local IC. Now, <coughs> let's look at this. I have defined this function w of theta, theta a hat, right? This is the type theta consumer's utility of reporting theta hat. Now, if we maximize it, we're going to get theta as the optimal solution because we have IC constraints. So by definition, I'm going to say if I plug in the optimal solution, then that should be W of theta theta, which is just W theta. So I define W theta as type theta consumer's equilibrium utility. Okay, eventually he will tell the truth. So W of theta, one parameter theta is enough to denote his, uh, his equilibrium utility. Now, According to my envelope theorem, I can show how W of theta is affected by theta. Okay, so by definition, I have this W theta is a function of theta, so we can find its derivative with respect to theta. And the envelope theorem tells us that, or envelope theorem tells us that I can first treat theta hat as a constant. Okay, theta hat is my variable. I treat my variable as constant and take the derivative with respect to my parameter. After that, 
I'm going to plug in back my optimal solution, which is just data about telling the truth. So I now want to take derivative with respect to theta. And this is my W theta theta hat. If I treat theta hat as a constant, then the derivative would just be V of Q of theta hat because the only variable is here. Okay, when I take derivative with respect to theta. So now I have this, and the last step is to plug in theta hat according to our optimal solution. That's this. Okay, so I can show that W prime of theta is V of Q of theta. V of Q of theta. Okay, this must be true as long as I have my IRIC constraints. Okay. Uh, one thing that I want to remind you is that actually you can prove this without using the <coughs> envelope theory as a general tool. You can still prove it by using your local IC constraints. Okay. You can first say that you want to do a differentiation for w of theta theta uh, w of theta theta okay which is this guy okay if you plug in theta before you do the differentiation then you get this and then you will differentiate this one with respect to theta then this this and this they are all variables so you are going to use the chain rule once and twice to, to, to get a s quite complicated thing. But then because you have local IC, a lot of terms would cancel each other and eventually you will get the same thing. Okay, so maybe you want to try it at home. Okay, so now we have this. Let's see how that can help us. Now you have this particular thing, right? What does that imply? That implies given any theta, given any theta, I now can write down its equilibrium utility like this. Okay? Eventually, I have a base, which is W of theta 0. And then from theta 0, I go up to theta. And throughout the path, I collect all the increments I should get. Okay, all the increments I should get. Here, this guy is W prime of theta. So again, you are applying the basic, uh, the, the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fundamental theorem of calculus. Okay, so you fr start from here, go up to theta, and collect all the increments, all the infinitesimal increments, and that goes to your... W head, uh, W theta. And don't forget, W of theta zero is this one. This is the type theta zero consumer's equilibrium utility, the lowest type consumer's equilibrium utility. We know a few things. First, V is a non-negative quantity. Okay? For any Q, V of Q is non-negative. This means that all the guys whose type is greater than theta zero would earn more than the lowest type. Okay, would earn more than the lowest type. So that's something that you you can understand. And then, given that, there is really no reason for you to give that particular guy to give the lowest type any utility. Okay, you you it's safe for you to set its utility to be zero which means to make the IR constraint, to make the remaining IR constraint binding. Okay, even if you do that, all other types, they will choose, they will be willing to choose their contracts because they can still earn a positive amount. Okay, so now we can say the IR constraint must be satisfied if we set it as a binding constraint. And once we do that, this term, would become zero, okay? And that means all you have is this part, 
which is this part. And, and now recall that you have defined W of theta as what? As Q of V, uh, Q, uh, theta times V of Q of theta minus T of theta. Okay? W has been defined to be the utility. Okay? Theta V of Q of theta minus T of theta. So what you get here is just by definition. Okay? You flip the signs of from here to that, that to here. And then you replace W of theta by what you just derived. Okay? So at any optimal solution, your T should be a function of Q in this way. T should be a function of Q in this way. So now that's plugging T into our objective function and continue. Our re program can be further reduced in this way. T is here, okay? And I replace T by what we just derived. A for every theta, T of theta should be exactly this, okay? According to our derivation. So now our problem would just be this one. Now we don't really need those IRIC constraints. Let's focus on this unconstrained problem to see uh, how may we find Q of theta to optimize this guy. Obviously, this is something we need to handle. Okay, and now it's time to use integration by parts. So let's focus on this double integral. Okay, if you go back to look at the objective function, this is that double integral within your objective function. With integration by parts, we're going to solve it. So that this part to be our u, and f of theta d theta be our dv, and then u goes to here. For dv, we need to find its v, and for small f, its integral is just capital F. So we get this. And then here, we have theta 0 and theta 1 as our lower bound and upper bound, so it's here. And they are here again. And we finally have v du. v is here, right? And the du, you know how to do it, because if you differentiate this guy with respect to theta, then you're just going to get something inside. Oh, theorem of calculus, fundamental theorem of calculus. Now you plug in theta 0 into here, theta 1 into here, the interesting thing is that if you plug in theta 0 here, f of theta 0 would just be 0 because theta 0 is the smallest possible value. Okay, so that term would just disappear. If you plug in theta 1 here, f of theta 1 would be 1. So all you have is here. Okay, it's this term, which theta becomes theta 1. For the second term, well, let's still put it here. So now the two terms can actually be combined because you are doing the integration from the first from the same point to the same point with respect to the same variable. So all we are doing now is to combine the two terms so that you get one minus capital F times V of Q as your integrand. So with integration by parts. This double integral can be removed, and all you have would be something like this, okay? 1 minus f, 1 minus f, v of q, v of q. Here you have an f of theta, because here you want to multiply the integral by f of theta. If you want to do that, you need to also divide it, so that here, you have f of theta, f of theta, f of theta, so that you can really replace the double integral by this term, okay, by this term. And now you see why you need to have some idea about the hazard rate, because it shows up here during your derivation. Okay, lastly, we want to find Q to solve this particular program. So still here you have so many variables, so many variables. But the interesting part or the easy part is that all these problems are independent. You can solve 
q of theta for each theta independently. And why is that? Because they are not connected with each other. Okay, so we call this point-wise optimization because you have a lot of points locating on one interval. You want to solve for all the points one by one. For this point, solve it. For that point, solve it. Point and points, they are not related to each other. So we want to do this point-wise optimization. For each theta, I want to focus on just the integral. I don't really care about small f because it has nothing to do with my q. Okay? And I also don't need to care about the integral. So I only focus on the integrand. And now q of theta is my decision variable. So I want to find q star of theta according to the first order condition. This part is just a constant. v becomes v prime. q becomes 1. So this is my first order condition. Okay? My q star should satisfy this equality. Of course, if the if if your theta, if for some theta the equation cannot be satisfied, for example, when this part is negative, then your q star should just be zero. And you also have this when you have only two types, right? There is a possibility that you don't want to serve the low type. Here is the same thing. If your theta is, for example, too small, then you may want to ignore those consumers. That's possible. Your t star can also be found according to the formula that you derived a few slides ago. Okay, so the last step is to check that we really satisfy monotonicity and the local IC because we somewhat removed them or ignored them during the derivation. So is that true? Your Q star satisfies this. Oh, for each theta, you have one Q star of theta, and that should satisfy this. So if that's the case, then let's focus on this equality. By assumption, this ratio is decreasing in theta. Okay, we assumed that for theta, the hazard rate is de increasing. So this ratio would decrease. And then theta minus the, the, the reciproc reciprocal of hazard rate would increase. So this part is increasing. The right-hand side is constant. So when your theta goes up, this goes up, that means v prime must go down. So v prime of q star must go down. And because v prime is a decreasing function, so if you need this function to decrease, that means your q must increase. Okay, so that's how you show your monotonicity. Your monotonicity really comes from your assumption that this guy is decreasing. And then you can also verify your local IC. We know that our optimal contract must satisfy this equality. The, the payment, the transfer, must be a function of quantity in this way. If you differentiate both sides with respect to theta, okay, t becomes t prime, here you need to apply the chain rule, and here if you take the derivative, you will get just v of q theta because of the theorem of calculus. And then this cancels that, you really get this and that, okay, which is exactly your local IC. That means for any q, if you always set your t in this way, then local IC is fine, okay. So you can see that even though we have removed the monotonicity constraints, we can still satisfy it with our optimal solution. Then our optimal solution is really optimal. And your Q should be defined in this way, your T should, as your T should be defined in this way, then you have the optimal solution. Okay. Okay, so the difficult part has finished. You now have went through the derivation of the optimal menu of contracts. Now let's read the result and do some implications. When we were working with the two-type model, we have mainly three things. We have monotonicity, efficiency at the top, and no rent at the bottom. Now let's see whether they are still true with our continuous type model. 
So of course, monotonicity is still there, right? At our very first step one, or at the end when we do the final check. So monotonicity is there. For higher type, the quantity designed for him would be larger. And then, how about no rent at bottom? This is exactly an outcome of our binding IR constraint for theta zero. Okay, if you want to have a fresh memory of that, go back to our、uh, step five, I believe. Yeah, that's where we show that at any optimal solution, that constraint should be binding. If you want to see that from the optimal contract, there is no problem. So t of theta zero. Should be calculated according to the T formula by plugging theta zero into theta, and then the last term here is zero. There is nothing to collect from this integral, so you have this, and because W of theta by definition is the utility you obtain by consumption minus your transfer, if you observe that they are the same, then you understand that this is zero. So. All the higher types, they will earn positive utilities, or which we mean information rent, because they have their private information, because they have the threat to lie, so they can earn information rent. But the lowest type is just so unlucky. There is no reason for him to lie, so there is no reason to leave him any information rent. Okay, no rent at bottom, but again. Now we actually learn some more things. No rent at bottom becomes no rent only at bottom. When you have two types, you don't really know when it is generalized to more than two types. Well, we always have no rent only at bottom, or we will have no rent for more than one type, right? We only know that the low type has no rent, the high type has has rent. We don't know what will happen if we have more than two types. Now we can answer this question. When you have more than two types, when you have, for example, a continuous type, then only the last type, only the lowest type, has no rent. So we have no rent, only at bottom. And now, <coughs> how about efficiency at top? What we want to show is that for the top type or the highest type, the quantity is efficient. So we need to first find the first best quantity, which is denoted as Q of F B, and the second best quantity Q star. And here is the formula for Q star. And if you go back to look at the original problem again, even though we didn't derive that for you, you should be able to derive that Q first best is satisfied is satisfying this. Particular equality, or you may make some comparisons between this and the two-type efficient problem. So let's assume you can do that by yourself. And now let's compare these two equation. Okay. So first we know one minus capital F over small f would be positive. Okay, for sure the denominator is positive. The numerator is positive. As long as your theta is not the highest type, so as long as your theta is not the highest type, theta is greater than this particular term, and that means, okay, if this is greater than that, then the blue part must be smaller than the blue part here, and that means you have this inequality. Now again, because v prime is decreasing. So that means your Q of first best must be greater than Q star. Okay, which is exactly what we need for this particular thing. Okay, so what does that mean? That means as long as your type is not the highest type, then your quantity, your second best quantity, has a downward distortion from the first best quantity. Okay, only for theta one, we have that this particular ratio is zero, and then you have no distortion. You have no distortion. So some conclusion, except for theta one, 
we always have a downward distortion on quantity. Efficiency at top now can be generalized. Now we know it's efficiency only at top. Why is that? The reason to do downward distortion is that we want to prevent a high type from mimicking a low type. Because if your type is high, then you prefer high quantity. So if I cut down the quantities for low types, then you would have no incentive to lie. I need to do that to cut down your information rents, but when I do that, I also sacrifice some efficiency. So I need to find a trade-off. I need to find an optimal balance between efficiency and the rent extraction. All of these are exactly the same as what we did with just two types. Okay, so summary. We have introduced a screening model with an infinitely many types of agents on a continuum. Okay, a continuous type screening model. All those implications from the two-type model are still valid, and, of, and moreover, they are also extended. We had monotonicity. Now, monotonicity is still true throughout the continuum. It's not one is greater than the other one. Now, it's throughout the interval. It is increasing. In the past, we have efficiency at top. Now, we have efficiency only at top. We know that the top type is still efficient, and for all the others, it's inefficient. We now, we, in the past, we have no rent at bottom. Now we have no rent only at bottom. Okay, well, some new findings are added. Throughout this lecture, we also take this chance to learn or review some useful concepts or techniques, like hazard rate, integration by parts, and envelope theorem. Okay, they are also some useful things that if you continue the research direction in this way, they will be used uh, in the future. A continuous type model can actually be useful when you do research because as you can see, it is more general than the two type model. Okay, more general than the two type model. And it's much less tedious than the n type model. When you have n types, actually, your calculation or derivation would be very messy because when things are discrete, you just need to deal with them one by one. But when things are continuous, calculus can really help you a lot. Your derivation would be actually clearer. So, given that this is a course teaching you research methodology, and that's why even though the continuous type model is so difficult, we still need to take this lecture to really formally introduce that to you. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you.